Thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening for a conversation with Zesty Myers, a co-founder of R and Company, which is a cutting edge Tribeca design gallery that's one of the most prominent and groundbreaking galleries in the world, we think. <laughs> um, through research and exhibitions and publications, R and Company has resurrected a global interest in collectible design, including now iconic designers, Werner Patton, Wendell Castle, who's a favorite of mine, I love his furniture, uh, Greta Magnuson Grossman, and Sergio Rodriguez, uh, to name a few. Our own company is housed in a very beautiful uh, cast iron fronted building in Tribeca, which was beautifully adapted uh, to be this gallery. And that's one of the main things that we wanted, to, well, it's a main thing that we want to talk about tonight, um, is how the building was adapted and reshaped for its current use. And it's, it's really a wonderful thing to see. I don't know if any of you saw my enthusiastic little piece uh, this week uh, following my visit with Zesty, encouraging you to attend the program tonight. Um, but it, it's just a terrific place. And uh, I know you're going to enjoy seeing it um, and hearing about it from all of us uh, this evening. So at this point, uh, oh, I should add also that in the, in the building right now is a show called Objects USA 2020, which is a reprise of a show that was done 50 years ago um, with many of the same pieces that were in that original show. So it's, uh, it's the kind of thing that doesn't happen very often. And uh, um, is something that I really enjoyed seeing and I think that all of you would too. And we're gonna talk about the show uh, tonight. So I think at this point you all know the drill with a, a Zoom about um, asking questions uh, and raising your hand and how to do that. And you can type your questions in and uh, we are recording this. So it'll be available for future uh, viewing. So. To um, get on with the program and to introduce everyone, I'd first like to introduce uh, Suzanne Clary, who is a trustee of the Preservation League and uh, is co-chair of the Excelsior Society with Thomas Jane, who you are also seeing on the screen right now. Um, Suzanne is, has been working for many years on the National Historic Landmark Home of Founding Father John Jay and his descendants, as well as contributing research to the narrative of enslaved and freed African-American men and women who lived, worked, and were buried at the site, if you've never been um, to the John J. Peter J. home um, in Rye, New York. I hope that you all get a chance to visit. It's an absolutely stunning property. And Thomas Jane uh, has had a deep interest in architecture and the decorative arts uh, for many years, which led him to pursue a career in interior design. He worked with two of the most influential design studios in America, Parrish Hadley and Associates and Kevin McNamara Inc. Uh, before opening his own Thomas Jane Design Studio in 1990. He joined the league as a trustee uh, in 2018 and we're very pleased to have both Suzanne and Thomas as board members of the Preservation League of New York State. And it's, I have to tell you, it's an awful lot of fun to work with them. <laughs> I feel very lucky because the three of us have a lot of fun thinking about Excelsior Society and, and what can make it interesting for you um, as members of Excelsior and of the Preservation League. So now to introduce uh, our guest, uh, Zesty Myers, I turn the program over to Suzanne. So I'm, I'm very excited um, about this program. I first met uh, Zesty in uh, 2019, um, November, the fall of 2019, and uh, saw this amazing gallery space that he, he had created. And uh, the exhibit was Love by Pierre uh, Yovanovitch. And before I even stepped foot in the building, you know, I, I admired it from the outside, this, this extraordinary cast iron building 
I, I felt like I was already outside a theater or an opera house about to step into a dramatic space. And, and I had um, researched uh, Zesty and his partner and uh, our and company a little bit and, and learned um, about their, their predilection for blurring the boundaries between uh, design, practical furniture and fine art and their reputation, their impeccable reputation for, um, for making design accessible uh, to, to, to people um, of, all, of all backgrounds. And, um, and, and sometimes design or fine, you know, fine art is not accessible, and, but they created um, this space and this uh, company that, that does that. Uh, one person said, um, they, there's a tension and fluidity that they make coexist. And this space, which is relatively new, uh, formalized, um, you know, uh, this, uh, this, this tension and fluidity with a research facility at the heart of it. Um, you stand outside of it, you, you walk in and you see these spectacular Corinthian columns. And, and one thing that um, Frank did not mention is, is that uh, I, I, we, I love uh, uh, Greek revival uh, architecture and, and columns. Uh, we have a number at the Jay Mansion, but um, to see a, an 1869 um, building that otherwise would have been torn down or turned into a box and to see it restored and reused and rehabilitated with, with such sensitivity and creativity to create this contemporary space was, was just very, very exciting. And so tonight um, we're going to we're going to talk to Zesty at that to say and 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 what he has done it's not only a diversity of design but a diversity of of artists that are represented within this historic space um, and it's a and it's a resource for everyone so um, so I, I'd like um, to introduce Zesty and he has a PowerPoint for us uh, to share about, about how they made those decisions on, on this space back in 2018. Excellent. Um, we can start the PowerPoint, I guess, or start or show the first slide. So I think this is a, a well, we, you guys saw the outside of the space, but this is the way we took the space over. Um, one of the great things is we uh, personally knew the developer that developed the building and the developer spent many years really taking care of the property, which is, uh, and it's, and the, the developer we work with, they, the family only buys historic properties around the world. And this is a very, one of the smallest projects they've ever done. Um, and they, they, luckily they left the columns when they had to redo the inside of the building and they opened it up and they were considerate for us and with us. And we got to add to sort of what the developer had done. It, it was a really good development. And then, you know, we, when we found the space, we went through a series of uh, looking, searching for architects, as you would imagine, to build up the space. And we settled upon a, a man named Kula Pat Yantasan, who um, has an office in New York, but mainly based out of LA. And he has a company called Y Architecture. And um, he's done a bunch of galleries and he's built a few museums now. Um, and he's just really starting to come into his own or into the public eye this way. Um, he uh, recently been hired by the Natural History Museum here in New York. And he's also been hired by the Met to uh, um, help refresh the whole Asian wing. Um, and he did a wonderful job with us and understood us and got what we were trying to go for and how we could execute, execute how one, people from the public could come in and see things differently and have a space to discover to, to create for the creative, for the artists and the designers, a place to dream. And three, I think the biggest thing we wanted to try to accomplish is why retail was important to us growing into the 21st century and using the historic limit, using the past to get us to the future into the 21st century. We can go to the next. So luckily we were able, and um, in this case, some of these photos, the black and white photos are actually, uh, one of my uncles lives in New York and he writes a lot of the photography reviews for the Wall Street Journal, actually many of them. And he is a photographer himself and asked if he could come and photograph part of the process. Uh, his name is uh, William Myers and I'm happy that we had him and happy he captured uh, some of these moments of how we went through. We, we left um, the historic part, the columns, obviously you can see easily but we, we left um, 
some of the industrialness and added enough of identity to make it more into a gallery to show off the works, which if we can scroll to the next, it would be great. And it was, it, it was an ambitious project. Our space is three, three stories tall, almost 40 feet in height overall. Um, we're very fortunate that we have the atrium that you saw in the, some of the first images or you can sort of see here uh, because we can hang pretty incredibly heavy things. We max out at three tons is our limit for uh, if we can get it into the building. We can hang it, but we have to be able to get it through the doors still. And that, so you're seeing the process of us going through uh, renovating the building to make it adequate for ourselves. We go to next. Mm -hmm. And so now you see the space more finished on the left. And one of the amazing things that the column does or the columns do compared to um, the boxes that we created and those would be offices that are glowing on the left hand side is that it creates more of an avenue or a boulevard um, of how to look at things. And then you can see on the right, our first exhibition um, which was an overview of the history of the gallery installed and how it relates to the columns. And, um, and in this case, uh, my business partner, Evan Schneiderman, designed all these uh, islands um, to create a path of how to walk through and see things over the 20 something year history of what we've created. And um, we mixed the past and the present. So you're seeing on the left Brazilian design, and on the far right, you're seeing some Danish design. And then uh, it gets down where we see the Werner Panton chair, the blue chair. It gets into a mix of things we've done even to 20 um, years ago when we first opened up in Tribeca. We opened our first gallery in, in, in 2000 in Tribeca, which we still operate and run. And the new gallery is the Masterworks Gallery where we wanted to raise the bar on how to view and look at design and how to elevate it to a, the highest status that we could. And that's what we think we've accomplished with this space. Can we go to the next, please? This show was um, about a, a radical Italian design group called Studio 65, and it's just it's oddly reminiscent that it matches the columns and the idea from Franco Adrito or Studio 65 is that the, the columns would stack to make your own column if you wanted to go towards the heavens. So the three pieces that sort of match in color would stack into one piece. Um, this was the show where um, we were actually able to have him come last March before we had to shut down. And he actually, in the um, uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, had a radical, a radical Italian design show up, and he was able to fly there and give a lecture at the same time. And then the show stayed up all the way until September. And I got to live with it a lot when I came back to the city because I would come into the space and hang out in here. And this is sort of part of my pandemicness of being around these works for an excessive amount of time. Um, and it's, it, and they're old and the, it's interesting to show them with, with the cast iron columns because these pieces were made out of foam and they will eventually disintegrate. There's no way to preserve them from how they had um, technically were able to use the materials that were new to them at the time. We can go to next, please. And this is a different exhibition and you'll see how we um, push the space. We're always pushing how to get people to view. And this is a show we did about chairs. And we did a show about 50 chairs and we invited 50 different people. There was only one historic piece in the show and everything else was contemporary. But everybody from uh, galleries like from Gagosian on down lend chairs from their artists to people that are just known more as designers. And as we've mixed them together, um, you couldn't most people couldn't tell the difference unless they inherently knew the work of what came from a fine art gallery or a design gallery. The pink chair in the back is a lot more recognizable because the cause has a big exhibition today at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, we can go to next. And then here's a different show in the atrium of uh, one of the artists that we represent named Rogan Gregory. Some of you might know of him. Uh, he had a fashion line for many years. He was the one who in the early, early 2000s innovated the world of jeans, which became a huge thing in the world of fashion as it still is today and had a fashion company for many, many years. Um, and you can see his um, forms that he bases more on fertility, but how they hang in space. The biggest form to give you an idea, Derek scale is about seven feet tall. So these are big. And you see my office on the left, you can see me sitting behind on the same wall that's onyx and you see my business partner's office on the right 
But as you view in the space and look in the space, you see the boxes, you see how it's built, you see architecture, you see design, you see how, and where all of it is how to push people how to think and the difference in how we change space and to get people to flow between the three areas, but then also to view up, never mind to view down as you pass the levels and the textures that we've put in for you to walk on. We can go to next, please. And here's a show uh, that uh, James Matus curated for us, who is our director of museum relations. And um, it was a show based on the, um, partially, on, mostly on the history of plywood. Um, and you're seeing masterworks and some of them we know like uh, the Alto Alto chair that's front and center, but that is a chair from the Palmio time from when he built the hospital in the uh, 1920s or 30s. And you're seeing over on the right, um, one of the great uh, chaises from Marcel Breuer and it had original embroidery on it from the time. And it, we even took the show back and you're seeing the stack of boxes um, that are shaker to reference how uh, materials were, or the material of bent plywood has been so important and used actually from the 1700s on. We, we, we didn't, we couldn't, the shaker boxes are the oldest and we show various examples of this. And so this would get more into historic program where a lot of these pieces are also being collected um, strictly some of them can only be being sold to museums for the rarity and what they are. Can we go on to next? And this is our staircase that a lot of people love. Uh, we love it. It's the space that uh, Evan and I took over more that we, that's heavily designed. Um, it, um, the, the stone has a great function and I think the, the choice in using materials um, from the earth aren't utilized to the capabilities that they, they can be um, or could be. And the, I, you, we won't be able to see all the detail, but each stair is carved. And so we uh, were influenced in this by what um, Scarper did for Vanini at, in, in, uh, in Murano for their staircase, or even what Breuer did at, uh, well, at, at the Frick Breuer now, I should call it. Um, even the staircase there has a detail that most people miss. And there's other staircases that, that were happening in the 40s and 50s that gave us inspiration. But we also wanted to use uh, stone in a way because it, it gets to where, or the level of where we think we want to go. The stone will outlive us. And we wanted to hopefully create a space that if we're fortunate enough, will stay for many, many, many years to be used as a place to view things or and to also sell things. Um, and we wanted to bring back something from the past as well to reference part of the architecture that we would, we would see from different parts of history that we felt that was being unutilized. So um, like the staircase at the V&A in London would be a good example of, it, of what, why is this not happening more for luxury today or style, um, even from a historic perspective or taking it into a contemporary realm and the stone was obviously cut in, the, in a longer version to bring you up and down the staircase as you ascend or descend. And, um, and it, it's, it's really nice to uh, have it and able to find technicians to actually install it. The staircase was cut and carved and it's with a Portuguese marble and cut and carved in Portugal. Um, we couldn't go to like Vermont to Darnby. We could get the stone there, but we couldn't get the skill to cut the stone in the way that we needed to have it installed to this level in the country. So hopefully this level of craftsmanship actually comes back as something that's needed, maybe not on the scale of what we did of the height of uh, the staircase, but just even with using these kinds of materials is something that I would hope for. Can we go to the next, please? So now we're looking into um, our archives and it would make sense that we would have books and we started this way when we opened uh, the, the first gallery officially incorporated in 1997, uh, we couldn't search the internet for anything, of, of course. So we started to buy books as fast as we could to gain knowledge, to learn um, for ourselves. But for our clients, what we wanted to do was be able to prove that what, we, what we, we were offering to them was actually what we were saying it was, if we could prove it. So the books became our knowledge and became the brain. Um, we purposely put the archives in the middle of the gallery because it is the heart and brain of what we do. But the books is only a tiny component of what we collected. So as we found books, we would start to ask questions like, uh, 
we had a book on Oscar Niemeyer and it showed Brasilia, of course, and we're like, well, they wouldn't have imported all of the furniture if they built Utopia. There has to be local talent that would match his architecture. So we would just simply start to ask questions like this. And this started to take us on travels around the world. And as we traveled throughout the world, searching for things in different places, we would go to antiquarian booksellers in 96, 97, 98, 99, and ask, do you have a design section? And they'd be like, yes, no one's asked about that in 20 years. <laughs> and, and we would buy, and literally like buy everything um, and send it back. Even if, even if it was in the Finnish when we were going to Finland to look for Alto or something or Tapiovara. Um, it didn't matter what language, and it was a matter that we already could figure out that here was the proof of the pictures that we couldn't find in New York, and we couldn't get access to some of the libraries in different ways back then. And what we learned, what we figured out that happened is all of a sudden people start, knew that we had books and things, and they started to call us because lo and behold, we ended up with books that uh, the universities or the public library didn't have, and it was without trying to do this but we also started to take in archives from people um, that were looking for a place to place things uh, before they passed away. And, and if it was part of the program we were already doing, we started to take them in. And there was amazing amounts of material from original catalogs to ephemera to printing plates, to posters, to magazines, et cetera. And now our archive today has about 10,000 things in it with a full-time archivist and is enjoyed from elementary school students on up to the world's leading scholars and we can't house everything here because once it gets framed it, we can't house it in this building it has to be housed elsewhere and if it's framed it's been lent out to exhibition or been put in a show somewhere um, and so but then we set up appointments and change it out all the time and the archivist also if particularly if we have a historical show on um, she normally has her own exhibition that she gets to plan with part of our archives that relate to the current exhibition to show um, how those designers or artists from the time were able to achieve the goals of making the work. Um, the, one paint, uh, the one drawing that's up is of a screen from a woman named Greta Magnuson Grossman, um, who won good design awards at the moment. And we own her whole estate. And she has architecture still standing in LA and had her atelier on Rodeo Drive and designed for amazing people and won numerous awards, but what became largely forgotten about maybe, maybe mostly because she was a woman. Arts and architecture never wrote about her at the time, even if her house would be perfectly suited for it. Um, she was in numerous other museum shows. And now this, this drawing is one of the few drawings we've let go because the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston actually bought the screen and asked to be able to have the drawing with it. And it is on display in the Woman Take the Floor exhibition and it will be on display for two years, um, which was a great way to add to the idea of perpetuity to get people to recognize the importance of Greta Grossman which is part of the goal of the gallery. And we have now successfully added to that value with the placement of the drawing because we were luckily enough to have it and the screen, which we, which we found out is only made twice. And, and so then we get to carry on and give back at the same time that we get to hopefully make, which is a wonderful thing to be able to keep doing. All right, let's go to next. Oh, here's some of the publications. So the, our, our archivist, uh, Mina also runs um, our publishing department. And, um, and publishing is also another way that we can give back. We do it for a couple of reasons. One, we want to save the history of the past, but two, for the contemporaries, we want to create future history. The archives lends great credibility to this because we all know of stories, especially for the people I'm speaking here to tonight, that, oh, I let them tear it down or I threw away the original drawings or nobody cared, nobody asked. It's always the same story. Oh, why didn't you come four years ago, right? And we, we all know these stories. So in some ways, the contemporaries that we bring in sees the importance that maybe one day further down the line, there might be a future in what they, or how they actually plan to do the things they've done. Um, it adds, it, it gives them a, a different sense of confidence, right? If we could get the visions out of people's heads, and into reality or then find a way to create a perpetuity, um, we get to get to go somewhere else with these people. And the sense of Evan and I owning a gallery, um, the books are our perpetuity. Businesses don't last forever in New York and we all know that. 
uh, we're hoping we've already beaten the odds by being in business almost 25 years. But, and we've surpassed part of that in a great way. So hopefully we can get to 50 years now, right? But the only perpetuity we have presently, because our archives are in a business that's for profit, we sort of changed the rules. We didn't set it up as an institution yet or a not-for-profit because we don't have to. But we can make our own rules in the 21st century about how to run things. So the only perpetuity we have for the amount of work that we've done are the periodicals since most people don't ever throw them out. <laughs> we can go on to uh, next. Oh, that's the last slide I guess we have for today. Okay. Well, Zesty, thank you for, for taking us through that. Uh, I know I have questions and Thomas has two questions and Frank, and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. But um, I'd like to start off by asking you about the reaction of artists to this new space. I, I imagine you invite artists to the space and they walk through it and, and, and what is their reaction? Uh, mostly, I think they love it. Um, I haven't heard any negative comments. Um, they have visions for it. We haven't been through even a full cycle yet because we've only been open for three years and we lost a whole year of exhibition. So not everybody's gotten to use the space yet that's already in our stable, um, but they all, and the more time they come and see, and it's, it's, I think it's amazing because we can do also do, we have a very large space. So we have an exceptionally large gallery for anyone in the fine arts market or the design market, but yet we can do very small shows as well that are only a couple hundred square feet instead of a couple thousand square feet. And we designed the spaces that way to take advantage of how to get the point of view across of the individual so they can dream in the right way, but don't have to dream that they have to take up giant scale as well. Now, I, I remember that when I saw saw the um, Ivanovich, uh, you know, the the ex exhibit because there were these beautiful, you know, curtained rooms, very very intimate, you know, and you just kept going ro through room after room after room, not knowing how much more space there was, you know. So so a very flexible space, which again, like I, I admire that you kept the columns that you like. I mean, again, your vision for the space because a lot of people might have just gutted it completely and yet there's something about the way you move through it and also the way you can go to the top floor and look down on a space where you get a collection of Brazilian furniture. I know I know Brazilian artists are, are definitely um, a, a passion of, of yours, you know, some, some of the, the artists you've exhibited. Um, yeah. Thomas, Fre uh, Frank, do you have questions? Let's hear, I want to hear what Thomas has to say about this. I, I always like to wonder if uh, objects allow us to live a better life. Oh, so you want to go deep real fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just have the answer. I can just answer that in like three words, of course. Um, I think it's really one answer, yes. Um, I think from all the studies that have been done around the world, even with homelessness, we are wired with aesthetics. And if you give someone, and this has been performed, these tests have been performed in many countries where if there's a coat drive where it gets co cold and you offer um, a homeless person the, the warmest coat or say a blue coat or a red coat, um, they are apt to pick the color they like, not the thing that's gonna keep them the warmest. And so I think inherently we're all wired this way. And I think also as Thomas, you would know as well, I think uh, how people uh, react to materials. Um, I think in our chemical makeup, some, some of us need to be around wood and some of us need to be around metal more and some of us can mix them together. So is that the reason, Zesty, when I came to visit that you said that one of the things you want really is for people to love art and, and, and you're devoted to making people love art and want to have art and have objects? Is, is, is what you just answered to Thomas the reason why you feel that way? Um, sort of, I don't, I, I don't think everyone that comes here should like what we have. I think some people should really not like it as well. <laughs> I, I truly don't think we can please everybody, nor should we try. But I think the people that, but even if we don't please them and we get them to interact in a, right. let's say, a negative way, then there, there's a discourse. They're thinking, they're programming, they're pushing mm -hmm. for better or worse. And, um, and if their friend loves the space, let's say, then you have a real dialogue that starts. 
And if we can push the conversation forward, we're doing something right. Um, and, and I think that's good. We're, we're also, and the people should know that I think a lot of people that show certain things um, work in uh, niches so, um, of like nationality, like I only would show French design since they've controlled the decorative arts for so long, right? Um, that's not something we do. We, we represent design from five continents to create a, a different kind of dialogue. Um, we're also not stylistic, like we only don't sell just like Art Deco or just like Stickly or something. We want to challenge the convections of, do you think this is design or not? And the show we have up now does that greatly because uh, Miriam Boski and David Schwerner are loaning to us of people that were in the original Objects USA show that they now represent as fine artists, but 50 years ago they were craft artists using a craft to achieve their goals. Um, and which is also an interesting discourse and neither, neither is wrong, right? But this world is much closer than we, we actually think. Zesty, you, you work a lot with auction houses and museums too. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because, you know, here are these artists that you discovered and then suddenly they're selling at auction for, you know, much, much more. And, and the auction houses, the museums come back to you for information about them, perhaps even to use your archives. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're credited or miscredited a lot in auction catalogs these days that <laughs> we've helped launch someone's career, even if, you know, we, we get tagged a lot. And we would hope that they would want to do the right thing of cataloging, right? And a lot of the, a lot of the times they do, and there's a lot to learn, and there's uh, different laws in different countries about this as well. And it gets complicated now, especially dealing with something like um, with different kinds of wood, let's say, because that's where the laws come in. Um, that we might not have the same law in this country, but in another country, it, it means something completely different. So we, we try to help as much as possible. And yes, auction houses, the Christie's, the Sotheby's, the Phillips become our competition. If something takes off from us, they sure want to go and have it in their sale, in their contemporary 20th century sales. Um, that, that, that's good and it's not good because then they think we're going to just push the market in some ways and sometimes we can and then we, uh, we or we have to protect the artist because now it's a monetary thing of what we're doing and that is part of us being in a marketplace um, so it, it, it serves many functions that way on the museum end what we've been able to accomplish with museums in five years with James Matus is incredible we, we had sold to museums in the past or donated to museums but now as the recognition of what is design or why is it important or why should it be with this or, um, or in these areas or mixed in to different things with the fine arts or, or just with the bigger decorative arts programs for the last 100 years of what we're doing to get into their older programs um, is incredible how the museums have started to pay attention. And they're very much needed on the contemporary level that is the dream of most living people is to have that perpetuity. Right, that is what they crave or want. That's maybe for some of them the highest acceptance they could have in their own minds, which is a great goal to have. And, and for us to be able to achieve that with them and hopefully push that on further is an incredible thing. Um, and as we grow into the 21st century, uh, tastes are gonna change from the different ways um, museums are directed to the curatorial staffs or how they think they need to add or, or be mandated to fill certain parts of, well, okay, we stopped collecting design at this point, we need to go on. Um, and we're right in the beginning of what that's becoming and how uh, institutions are paying a bigger attention to the last 100 years. We, we had a conversation, which just, I think it went on for an hour, which I wanna go back to about, that relates to your current show about how we need design now more than ever to heal the rifts that are ongoing. And you have represented a lot of artists who, um, you know, from different cultural backgrounds um, in, in a time when we think about sustainability too, you know, many of your artists use salvaged materials. Do you, do you want to speak to that? You know, like how, what, what that show, you know, the, the exhibit 50 years ago was about and how the show you have now can, can be a healing experience for people. Yeah, so the, the, the original exhibition was ob called Objects USA. It comes on the heels of the civil rights movement. Oddly enough, how does our Black Lives Matter movement happen 50 years later exactly? Oddly enough, Johnson and Wax buys the whole exhibition 50 years ago. 
they keep about 5% of the show for themselves. And then the show opened the Smithsonian, the Renwick in DC. It was their first show. Um, the curators for the exhibition went across the country looking for what is American design and looking for diversity and culture, no different than what we're speaking, and found it and found amazing people and had about 253 artists with just over 300 artworks in the original show. And subsequently, Johnson and Wax gives the artwork away to all the museums that took the exhibition. It, um, so uh, certain museums got one, certain museums got 20 something. The Mad Museum in New York City today for the first time ever is showing the majority of the collection of what they got. They've never shown it before, but it's due because of the show that I think we've put on that they are trying to push this forward because they have amazing things from this time that they were never able to put out on the floor of, of the museum. Um, the show travels for 10 years to 30 different insti institutions wow. in parts of Europe, a little bit to Japan and across America. I think it was ABC does a, a full-length documentary that we have playing that Johnson & Wax has the rights to that gave us the rights to show it here about people using their hands. If this puts, um, it was written about relent like incredibly. It puts America on the map. It starts collectability. It makes the museums, it makes a gallery movement, it makes careers for people that didn't have them. And it, it had uh, a very big age span, of course, at the time. And subsequently what happened is I was also a maker. I used to be our, my own artist. My business partner was his own artist. And uh, maybe uh, for part of the goals or some of the exhibitions we showed pictures of or if you came today, presentation is everything to us. There's a whole, either it's right or it's wrong when we go to present it to the public. And it's really hard to achieve, especially with things you've never worked with. It's its own art and that's what Evan does. And he's amazing at doing this. Um, and his level of presentation, you know, really gets people seeing this is a value of our success that we've also said neither one of us had ever taken a business class, right? But we, but we knew the value of presentation and we were already showing in galleries across the country ourselves with our own works. We were already collected by institution and this started really as a hobby at the time. Um, Evan, I had started a not-for-profit arts organization that I ran for almost for 10 years in the 90s uh, called the B Team, where we did installation and performance art with Molten Class. Um, so then we, as we went through this, we knew that this world, where, by the time we were involved to continue this around, craft has become a dirty word in America. Um, and it's going away and the, um, there's too much of a lot of the work that was out there or, or they're showing the same, too many of the same thing at this time, and we, we knew we didn't have a chance to grow up in that world. The, the A-Team was always, the Del Chihulis were always gonna be the Del Chihulis and the Albert Pays were that. And Dale, Dale used to sponsor me to no end because he knew there needed to be something more than him at the time. Um, and he was exceptionally helpful, but he couldn't change that overall system of why aren't the young coming up through a gallery system to, be, to find another younger generation of collectors to influence a younger ge generation of curators to get then to the perpetuity of institution. That failed miserably in this country. So, and we also, I also personally think we shouldn't have been allowed to do this show that we have up currently. This should be at an amazing American institution. It should have started there because we're representing the country. We're not representing the gallery in this case, right? And we're showing 85 different artists because that's all we had space for. We couldn't get to the number of what they did. And, um, but we had to show the past to get to the future because there was no show 10 years later, 20 years later. There was no Johnson and Wax that stepped forward to help our community since then. Uh, this didn't exist, that, that give back didn't happen uh, from the corporate level on that way. So our goal with then bringing it to today was to show that America is rich with, once again, culture, diversity, with makers. And nobody ever does studies of this in our country, but how many people actually make things, not sell things, but actually physically make things because they, Maybe they have to, if it's one thing or a hundred things a year, right? And so we wanted to get, get to the future. We wanted to bring it to the future, but if we didn't show the past and how important the show was and show that like the Ron Nagels, the Sheila Hicks, the Lenore Tawnies, 
um, Annie Albers, et cetera, all the Michelle O'Connors, all, and the list goes on, the Albert Paley's, the Dale Shuley's, all came out of this show, the original show. So hopefully one of the 50, and we picked 50 from each side, right? And we tried to source the work as best as we could to the, to the time era of the historic and to put it with the 50 contemporaries and mix it together in two ways from what the curatorial staff did. And the curatorial staff did a great job and some of the works were really hard to get a hold of. So we, we have like the Nakashima bench that was very similar to the original one shown and that would be more of the blue chip, but we mix it with other pieces that might've been more forgotten like it's next to a Marilyn Pappas piece from the 70s. And this is done on purpose because we wanna show what needs to be rediscovered even if most of or a lot of Marilyn's work is already in institutions. It doesn't mean today's world knows about it, but everyone knows about Nakashima today. And we do the same thing for the contemporaries. And the same it, way. I mean, it's, 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 fant it's really fantastic to see I, I've got, I've, the juxtaposition. I've got, I've got a question along those lines. Uh, and I'm waiting for Thomas to ask a question about color, which he hasn't asked yet, and which he must have in mind. So here's my quick question. Who do you want? to see this show because galleries are generally visited by people who already care about art or interested in art or furniture or craft. But to the general person walking down the street, they often think that a gallery is not a place they're welcome in because it's about selling. So how do you, how do you who do you want to see this show and how are you going to get them in there to get your message? Okay, okay. Easy question. <laughs> uh, the whole country to start with. <laughs> um, everybody, there's no right or wrong. We, you know, we, we printed a book that's $50 on purpose. We have stickers that are $2, right? So people can feel that they're a part of it. We also opened the show uh, four months ago or so, more when nobody was still coming back up, but on purpose, because we wanted to use the overview in a way to help people heal, to give back to the people that could come or to try to encourage them that it was safe to come, because we're going to have to retrain all of ourselves, right? And we all, we all want this, but we all, we're, not, we're still not doing what we once did. We're not there yet. So the show is up until like almost the end of September. But if you can't get here, which a lot of the countries still can't get here or the world, um, you, can, you can still feel in touch by buying the book or even a sticker. And you can be a part of, and you have, you have a sensation that's human, right? If that's the least we can bring to them as of right now of a way I, to- I did, that. I did when I was there. I was just, I'm wondering who actually feels, who's got the courage just walking down the street to walk in the door? Well, that's always a hard thing as well. You know, um, we've, we, uh, people do, they're like, what is this thing, this object USA? Some people do come in that way. Uh, more people come because they know about it. Um, you know, the, the building is also very like, aha, you know, it's very uplifting. So that might would deter, like, I don't belong here kind of thing. And I can't control that, um, that way, but it's, it's, it's really open for everybody that way. Okay. Um, and we're, we, we encourage everybody to come and we keep, it keeps growing the kinds of people that are coming. And every week we're starting to get more and more people and having humans is a wonderful thing again, because we built this for <laughs> humans to come. We, we agree. <laughs> I would uh, but to finish the question. I think the White House should be involved, really government. They should be sponsoring this. This should be being shown at the White House. Um, this is part of our national identity. Um, parts of this should be on display. You know, the Sam Maloof rocker chair, rocking chair we have in here subsequently was given to four presidents. One is in the permanent collection of the White House. Um, uh, Jill Biden wore Monique Pion's earrings to the inauguration. She's in the show. Um, you know, it would, the country should be paying attention on a higher level of that, of where help could come from. But we're not known for doing that as a country. True. Interesting that we did it 50 years ago, but not, not now. What, what do you mean, Thomas? I mean, the, the original exhibit, the original exhibit was what, 50 years ago? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's in a national museum, it tours the country. And there's this, been this great renaissance in the interest of decorative arts, but not a show like this. 
which is interesting. And, and that, that becomes the goal of ours now is the, the next goal of ours is to get the show to travel. Yeah. And we're just getting to the point where we're, we have real interest if, yeah. uh, from all over the world actually uh, to show the works. And, but we, we purposely also need to make sure it's shown in America as well. Oh. Um, because we're, we want, and one of the other things, and I should say what else we've done with this to help grow the country or help the country is we've started a grassroots movement called With Our Hands, where mm -hmm. anybody can participate with a 15 second video of them making. And we have it on TikTok and on Instagram and on our website. Um, and and, this, and it's, we want the 20 year old in Ohio that I do not know, maybe I will never meet most likely. And I want the 80 year old in New Mexico that's been making work for 60 years, that has a view and understands something that I do not to become a part of this. That's, that's and what we've, gotten, we've yeah. gotten amazing videos and they're, most of them are incredibly well done. And, um, and it's growing. And we were even on TikTok, the biggest uh, video has over, already over 4 million views, which I didn't think was possible for design. And this is just starting, but, but the idea is so easy. It's hard for this to catch on to the level that it should. In the original show, everything was segmented. You were in silos of metal, wood, ceramic, fiber. And when you look at social media today, we can, everything is siloed in the same way, which almost doesn't make sense since everything's mixed together. I can go to the glass channels or ceramic channels or metal channels, but they don't, they're not woven together. So hopefully we can add that to culture with part of this, but we can use us at being at the top of the food chain in New York and being this big gallery to then dial it backwards the other way to the people that we're not looking for talent this way. There's no rules except for the engagement of social media rules of what their rules are to try to show that the country could come together more to share ideas and all these different techniques and styles. And lo and behold, who knows who would meet each other or find something they want. Mm -hmm. it, it, museology completely changes with the internet. <laughs> completely. Yeah, it's amazing. Wait, have, have you approached or would you consider approaching the Smithsonian to make about making this travel to make that connection? I, I know, you know, the Smithsonian has what, what, the division called sites where these exhibits do do travel. Um, is it is something you might consider? Sure. Yeah, we're, we're about to finish the deck for the museum presentations and we will present this to several and we know many of the curators or directors of different institutions. We don't, we don't have a rule about this. We love the right participation to find the right partnerships to grow this for the right reasons, to, to push the identity of America out there locally and then globally. I mean, because I, the thing that comes to mind too is just like, again, taking your exploration both through the exhibit and through the book, and then to look back towards, you know, where was the Renwick, you know, however many years ago, where is the Renwick today? Similarly, look, the, the Cooper Hewitt, where was the Cooper Hewitt, you know, 50 years ago? Like, where is it today? Like today, look at, you know, design museums, design galleries, you know, sort of in America holistically with this anchoring, this exhibit anchoring that perspective. Because I, I know, again, you do, it, through the pandemic, you did a lot of um, Zoom programs, not just with artists, but also with historians, you know, these wonderful dialogues too. So, um, yeah. so and we did that on purpose from the big giant ones to tiny ones, because we don't see a difference of importance as long as they're representing things that affiliate with what we're doing. Right, and, and it needs the small institution in, in different parts of the country are just as important as the giant ones in the bigger cities right. to help create this path of culture. So, so this is the time in the program we are opening up uh, to questions that people wanna raise their hand, either ask a question in the chat or ask a question by raising your hand. And one of the first questions um, is from Fabio Fernandez. Um, are there any exhibitions around architecture that you would like to realize? And I'm, I'm sure they were inspired by seeing that picture of the, of the columns <laughs> within um, the building with the columns. Yeah, there's, I would love to be able to use more architecture to create exhibitions for one, either contemporary or historic. Uh, we've done projects like with, with Richard Meyer and the first glass towers that he built on the West Side Highway. And this summer, it will open publicly in the second week of July at the, it's the Schlumberger building, Philip Johnson's first commercial project in Ridgewood, Connecticut. 
uh, that are owned by our friends Bassam Fellows who are furniture designers. And it will be open on Fridays and Saturdays to the public. And we will be, never mind, will they be showing their furniture line? They have meticulously restored this building and um, to the, and been given uh, from Dokomomo and other such people in the architecture world, um, given like the awards that they deserve for what they've done. Um, but it's the first time that the building will ever be open to the public. And um, with that, we're gonna be showing a, a masterworks of historic furniture, historic textiles that were some, a bunch of them were on view at the, had been shown at the MoMA and with contemporary art. So we're showing like people like Jean Arp and other such people in this context uh, that uh, the galleries have given us as well. Um, and it should be uh, quite a way to work with architecture um, and to be able to do things. And um, uh, originally Pierre Coning offered to design our first gallery, um, he, uh, but he came too late. We already had, had it designed when we first opened, but he, and there's been many other people like that that we would uh, love to do projects with or help them with their projects in a way. And if there was ever the right exhibition to do, we would love it. I'd like to ask you a question about the architecture. So this is a space that you walked into, you saw raw, you showed us the pictures of it, and then you decided to change it. I think probably the biggest architectural change that I saw was the, the opening to the back and the staircase that goes down to connect the three floors, your marble staircase. And I was just wondering if you hadn't seen that broken through like that, would you have done that? I don't think we would have been able to afford to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were very fortunate that way. Um, that, um, and also the way the back of the building was taken all down and, and light to be let in 40 feet down because you can't really tell that you're in a sub basement. It, it works incredibly well. And luckily we are in a landmark neighborhood where we shouldn't lose that quality of light over time. Um, so we're, we're fortunate that way. Um, but no, I don't think we would have done that. Is that the first multi-floor space you've exhibited in? Oh no, the, the other gallery on Franklin Street is two stories open to the public that we also broke through the floor. And I thought, the well. question, I thought the question Thomas was going to ask, but he didn't, was about color as a background for displaying craft. Because you're, it's all white inside, except for the wall behind you, and apparently a yellow wall above that, which you see from the big space. And in one of your pictures, you had a vivid blue carpet, but that's not there anymore. Um, how do you feel about color, the use of color in the space which is designed to show art and furniture? Oh, we, we use it all the time. We've actually had the walls painted by painters. You did? For, for display. We've done full wall vinyls. We've done full walls of color. It all depends on, on what the idea is of how we need to present. Also, if we're working with people that are living, they might have other ideas that go along with how they want their show presented as well, depending on what the dialogue is that we want to try to get across to um, the public. Um, we showed uh, Ashley Hicks about two years ago and he came in and did one of his wonderful detailed paintings that almost looked like wallpaper, but he painted it by hand on the wall. That was incredible. Um, and he actually then made screens instead of us putting up like a sheetrock wall to block out um, everyone else from seeing. But we, so we do this all the time, um, depending on what, in, in the show we have vinyls that are hanging that are black, blue, and bright red in this current show as well. So it's a constantly changing space. Constantly, yeah. So we, so we have a question, another question. Um, so uh, have, has anyone who uh, saw the, the, the show 50 years ago come to see this show or, or, or inquired about it or some of the original artists, you know, have, have you gotten reactions from people who were intimately involved with the first show? Yes, um, we've had two or three of the original people been able to come and see the show, okay. which is fantastic. Um, we um, have been able to have people interviewed for other magazine articles that cannot get here from the original show. Um, 
There are people that have now been in the original show that have had other works that are now offering them to us because oh, they great. think it's home. So, which is something <laughs> we're cherishing because we love and didn't know and finding some great things for us to have to be able to put into perpetuity or to another level of collection, which is wonderful. Um, uh, more of the contemporaries are able to come, a lot more of them are local as well. And um, so we've been very fortunate that way so far. And do you have another question? Uh, do you have your, your eye on any other new artists? That, were, were there people that you really wanted to include that you couldn't include, but that, that you, if you, you know, if you, let's, let's say you do a sequel to this that, that, you, that you can share with us. Oh yeah, so the, the, our idea, but this is too far in the future and we can't prove this yet, is that in two or three years from now after the show comes down, is we do the show again, but only with contemporaries only to push current forward because we have represented the past to show why we could get to today and get to tomorrow. Uh, that is an idea we have, but we haven't started to formulate uh, what that would be it, except that we want to do this. And so let's say it happens between two to three years from now and gets in the schedule. And yes, there is, um, there's always so much great talent out there. Our problem becomes time. We, mm -hmm. only, can, we only have so much time. And um, we are taking in and taking on new people now. And there are people in the show on the historical level and the contemporary level that we are exceptionally interested in and, uh, and working towards that. And there will be more being added to our stable over the next few months that we will start to announce more publicly as the year goes on. And, and so you, you also, you, you did share this a little bit with, uh, with through uh, Frank's question, um, that you have the other um, gallery on, on uh, you know, you've got White Street and Franklin Street. Are you, are you eye eyeing any other cast iron buildings <laughs> for um, new gallery uh, space? Uh, I personally live in one. I also live in the neighborhood and we recently brought it back to Landmarks in about two years ago which was a great project to work on. And we worked with Preserve to restore the building and uh, the ground floors cast iron and the rest turned out to be marble. We knew it was stone, but had no idea that it was marble. Um, and we've almost finished that whole project now. So, well, maybe one day I'll have another thing, but as a gallery, I, I, I have the palace of my dream. I have a floating office. I feel very fortunate that we've been able to achieve these things. And I would like to then relax a little bit for time and uh, execute program of how to make, um, uh, get the other people we represent to as big as they could possibly become. Yeah. Well, well we, we feel very fortunate for, for this time with you and a very, very personal, um, you know, view of, of how, you, how you've balanced architecture, art, design, and made it all, um, you know, physically accessible, emotionally accessible, intellectually accessible. It's, it's really, really impressive, Zesty. We're just so, so happy to have you tonight. And then I want to remind everyone, we also have, um, for, for those, of who, uh, those of you who would like to visit the gallery and the exhibit um, itself in person, we have, uh, Zesty is opening the gallery this Sunday from 1 to 3 p.m. for Excelsior members and their, and their guests. And I, I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing the, the current exhibit, for sure. I look forward to having all of you on Sunday. We look forward to being there. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Thomas. Bye. Thank you, Zesty, for uh, this great conversation. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Please join us, everyone. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. And there's a, link, there's a link in the chat for anyone on tonight. You can find the link in the chat box. And just click on that to register so we know to welcome you on Sunday. Thanks, Thank Susan, you. for saying that. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.